Welcome everybody. This is our first Vault Vision Engineering Deep Dive video. And today we're going to be looking at HA Proxy. So Chris, when you were creating our HA Proxy rate limiting rules, uh, you mentioned you found some really interesting and neat parameters and rule sets uh, that you found could help out anybody that's looking to rate limit or add rate limiting on their HA Proxy server. Yep, that's correct. There's a lot of resources out there, but it's kind of hard to find things that you can adapt to all the different use cases that people have. So I kind of gathered up some nice patterns and put them in an HA proxy config and put them on GitHub. That's super fantastic. And I see we're looking at the GitHub repo right now. So why don't I try to step through all of the information you've put on this repo and see if I can uh, become familiar <clears throat> excuse me, with all of these rate limiting features. Sure, let's go for it. All right, cool. So, and everyone will put the links to these repos in the show notes, but let me grab the URL and then let me jump over to the console. And this console is just a local VM uh, that's running uh, Debian, the latest version of Debian. So let me start off by just git clone our repo. And this is, like I said, just a stock Debian box running in a virtual machine. And let me go over to the content. You've already configured Docker and Docker Compose. Yeah, actually, you're. thanks for bringing that up. That's the only other thing we've added is Docker and Docker Compose. And uh, for that, you can find your own engineering deep dive. We're not going to go through that today. <laughs> All right. So let me. Uh, so the nice thing about your repo is you've set up everything in Docker so that it's really trivial for all of the pre-configuration. Everything just spins right up as soon as I hit Docker Compose up. Is that right? Yep. And since you have Make, you can just type Make. Oh, do I need to type Make first? You can type make or you can do docker compose up inside of the readme. I kind of give alternate commands so that way if you don't have make installed, you can use either. It's so whatever is easier for you. So here you could use docker compose up dash D if you wanted. Okay, cool. And the dash D, what does that do? That runs it in the background. Okay, awesome. Otherwise, docker compose up will block until the container exits. Okay, super. So, uh, well, for this example, should... Uh, we run it in the background, or is it useful to see it running? Well, if you type make and then logs, yeah, you'll be able to see the logs, and that's basically the output that you would get if you're running it in the foreground. This just kind of frees up another terminal, so you don't have to spin up another terminal just to run some commands while you're tinkering around. Okay, great. So, so this is probably the way to go. Yeah, so we'll, let's just do this for now. And now the nice thing about this is, uh, we've got some steps in the readme that we should go to. Yep. So let's switch over to our browser and take a look. Okay, so the very first thing we've got is a little bit of uh, some general summary information about what's in the repo. And you mentioned you read a lot of information on the blog, but there really wasn't a lot of concrete examples on some of the more advanced techniques. And so You've got yeah. at least uh, four examples of maps and other configuration items. Exactly. Exactly. We kind of combine multiple features because the examples are really great for getting down to the essence of each individual thing that you're trying to do. But a lot of them are based on static values, for example. So static paths, static rate limits. But we want things to come from configuration. So... That's where we kind of diverted a little bit. Okay, great. So it looks like we're going to be able to rate limit by specific source address, and that's an IP address we're talking about. And then we can combine not only the IP address, but the destination URL that they're trying to uh, reach. Is that right? Yep. And those are separate. Yeah. And that'll be separately tracked. Yep. That, that's useful because we've got some more sensitive endpoints like a password reset endpoint or a account a user account creation endpoint that we really want to be a little bit more strict on the amount of connections 
where things like static asset downloads, we really don't care that much. So this is a super great feature. And next we've got the simple mechanism uh, to block entirely by a source address. So can you explain this one a little bit? Yeah, so if we see someone's doing some bad stuff, we can easily kind of severely limit them. So we can add a really strict rate limit to the rate limits by IP, or we can just block them entirely. And that means block them from even making connections. So it does even go through the rest of the typical rate limiting checks. I see. So, so that's by adding them to blacklist.list. Got it. So this is something we use kind of at runtime when we see something uh, in our logs that's going on that we want to just shut down immediately. You've got a nice pattern here for how we can do it uh, in a kind of a pre-built way. And all we have to do is just add yep. that source and away we go, right? Yeah. And likewise, it also actually allows you to raise the limit much higher for anything that is like an internal IP address, for example. So if you wanted to say a specific IP address should have a much higher limit, you could also at a higher rate limit too. So it may be internal traffic, for example, like from Prometheus or something. Okay, great. And then when we're talking about the next one with resources consumed, what resources are we talking about? Just connections or? Just system resources in general. So network connections, memory, everything else, network traffic. Okay, really. We're so... out in the cloud, so they charge you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, we definitely don't yep. want those consumed. Uh unless they're actually doing something useful. So when you say memory, are you are you saying that literally HA proxy can uh, read out how much memory that particular request is allocating or how does that work? So they give you some kind of rough baselines for how much each connection costs and each request costs, but there are ways in the stats and points that we'll see later and through the metrics exporter in the Prometheus exposition format that you can get kind of deeper information about how much bytes in, bytes out, and memory and CPU and that kind of stuff. But Okay, but at the beginning, you can yeah. basically kind of pre-allocate how much... Uh... Well, by adding upper bounds on things that consume resources, like the number of requests you can make in a given time, by making those bound by something that costs someone something, like their source address, for example, you're kind of, that's how you at least add an upper limit to how much that they can use. So Got it. And those you're costs, indirectly limiting it just through adding bounds to all of these different things like connections. Got it. And those costs, you say there's some sane defaults, but if you want to overwrite that and customize them, you can. Yeah, we've given some sane defaults, some that are less sane in this example. So some that are really low, just so we hit those thresholds easily. But I kind of annotate where those are. Got and it. Yeah. So this is really useful if you had some types of requests that spin up a lot of server resources versus other types of requests that just say serve a static image. You can yep. really tune to make sure you're, you've got these limits on the ones that really consume resources. That's really cool. Okay, yep. now explain to me these HA proxy maps. I know you were able to do some really cool stuff. Explain what those yeah, do. So the, the maps basically give you key value pairs that you can load at runtime at different stages. So you can load them when the process first starts. You can load them per request. You can do lookups in these files. And you can also, you know, make kind of changes to them. It's a little it's a little limiting the making changes to them at runtime, but it is possible. And that can be a nice bonus too. Especially if you're just adding and deleting entries from it. Um, it doesn't work so well for like re you can't replace an entire map very easily. You actually have to take out all the keys and toss them back in. So that is one shortcoming I found. But uh, if you're just using it to add and remove paths and change rates, then it works really well. So it's good for like some ops. Got it. So this good. simplifies future ops because you don't have to change your main configuration. You can just add and remove paths or add and remove values in and out of these maps without having exactly. to uh, risk touching the main config and bringing down, let's say, the entire the entire web yeah, server. Yeah, only like the risk of touching the config, but it's really about the fact that you, ha you don't have to wait for your HA proxy to drain. And like, depending on what kind of 
traffic you have, how long lived your connections are, if you use WebSockets, etc. It can, if you don't have to, you know, reload your HA proxy, then all the better. Okay. Very good. And it, and beyond that, you know, using the pattern of using these maps and how to assign the values and how comparisons work for the rate limiting, it is actually probably useful for some people who might want to have dynamic backends or other things that change at runtime. So it goes beyond just rates. Oh, very nice. Okay, great. So we've already jumped through the quick start with the Docker Compose up. Yep. Uh, and now that we're up and running, we can see four different things. We can see the default backend. We can watch some stats, look at some metrics. And then this one is the special debug page. Now you've got uh, yep. some really interesting instructions on how to do debugging. Uh, was the debugging super useful for you and setting these things up? You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so one of the first things I ran into when I was trying to get some of the rate limiting incorporated from all these different resources on the blogs and, you know, other random gifts on the internet and stuff, I it was difficult to figure out when I was hitting these thresholds, if the thresholds were being overwritten correctly since, you know, I add more specific rates as you get further in the ACL checks. So it's kind of hard to know at any given point what if you're being rate limited off of the right ACL or the right rule. And the debug page has some techniques on basically converting an ACL truth check into a string and displaying it as well as showing other request information. If you wanted to click it, you could probably see a little bit okay, well, right now. Actually. Yeah, let's uh we'll start off with the debug page here. And sure. here we go. Local HA proxy. Yep. And so I I print a few environment variables. So, you know, obviously you can add whatever environment variables you want here. And that's kind of useful just to, you know, know if the HA proxy debug is clearly on. This kind of more of an example thing, but uh, we have some other internal environment variables that are relevant for us that it's nice to see here. Got it. Okay. And again, here's some of those. Are these the costs limits? We have connections, rates, some global yep. values, as well as some per path values. Yep. So we have the global rates, which apply for anything that doesn't fall within the more path specific checks. So that's like the global number of concurrent connections and then how many connections can you create newly connected connections rather versus you know how many concurrent connections you have active so got it so we've got and they're all just a sequential series of numbers just because it makes it easy to identify the source of when you're being rate limited like with those rates that you see below the con cur max etc those it's nice to know where those are coming from Got it. So these IDs, these are just kind of uh, identifiers for this for use in the maps later. Exactly. Those are basically from the config.map above. And those are just the baselines for when there's nothing else being specified in any of the other files that give you more specific granular blocking of a IP address or of a path. So when it doesn't exist in your path list, it'll get it from HTTP rate limit. Got it. And what, what are these uh, TXNs? So there's different scopes during the life cycle of a request in HA proxy. The proc is something that happens a singular time when the process loads. So those, we don't change those. Those just, the first time we restart HA proxy, these are the defaults. Um, they're pretty generous usually. So we have pretty big defaults for a lot of those values and then the per transaction comes from the rates by URL, rates by IP. And those can be changed via the map editing because we check those maps every single request. And that's the transaction scoped variables. Got it. So it's using these transactions is how we're able to uh, apply limits on very specific paths and very specific uh, yep. connection rates, right? Yep, it gives us a request scoped bucket of values that we can pass around and, and check and make ACLs with. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, yep. And then ACLs, explain this. So I, when I hear ACLs, I think of permissions, but that's not really what that means in this context, right? 
Well, it sort of is, I guess. The access control list is, I guess, what they're, what they're, what they stand for in HA proxy, and that's kind of what they are. You know, you you form ACLs from conditions, and there's a lot of documentation around that. But one thing that you can't do with the ACLs is just log them. So you can't just log a, an ACL identifier. So what I do is I, and we could probably check that out if you wanted to in the config, but at the end of the day, I just do a simple check inside the config and then actually set a transaction variable with the name is global concur limited. That is either true or false based on the outcome of the ACL. So Got it. it's just a technique so I can actually see whether or not these values are true or false. Right. So in my uh, previous comment about ACLs being for permissions, that condition is usually whether somebody has access. But you're using the ACL condition is some of these limiters so that when well, this... yeah, essentially you're, you're not wrong, but the HA proc is kind of like a term within HA proxy. So within their official docs, what they call these things that we declare, they're literally ACL. So there's a ACL declaration. Got so it. we're kind of making sure we stay within their own domain term of ACL their access control list. I see. So you can do an access control based on some arbitrary, well, maybe not arbitrary conditions, but some uh, specific yep. conditions based on some of the variables and some of the limit states. Yep. They're pretty robust and they, there's a lot of things you can do with them, but essentially they have a concept of criterions. So ACLs have an ACL name, a criterion, and then they have some flags, an operator and a value. And there's some rules there, you know, it's a, definitely a DSL and it's got its quirks, but it's pretty powerful. And for the most part, there's usually a way to do what you want to do. Got it. Okay, great. So this debug yeah. page, this really uh, is very helpful to get a quick overview. And then let's go back to our blog. Let's just take a look at the default backend. So uh, this isn't too exciting. What What is this? Is just what HA proxy spits out by default? Exactly. So this is basically just a test backend, but what it would be is if we were running some kind of service, the response from that service or what the status of that service is. And once we hit our rate limits on this page, this would no longer say, you know, backend B local host UI, we would actually start hitting the tar pit for the, until we were blocked elsewhere. So, so this is basically simulating a real application. So yeah, application... our backends are just kind of dummy backends that don't do much. Got it. So this is just letting us know our application is healthy. And when we hit F5 here, our application is up and running. So when we start attacking this, we should see this. Oh, look at that. Yep. Yep. That's what we want to see. So that meant our, we hit some rate limit and HA proxy engaged and now blocked access to that backend because I was eating exactly. up too many server resources. Yep. And now if I wait a little bit, let's see, I'm back. I'm back in. If yep, I after wanted... 10 seconds. So that's the default that we went for is we have a 10 second sliding window. Yeah. And so if I want to be uh, bad again. We can try that again. And then boom, I rate limited. So I consumed some resources, but got blocked. And so if somebody was scripting, this is perfect. Because yep, little... and if you were to con continue holding F5, eventually you might hit a, a higher limit on like your connection rate. Mm -hmm. And it would go from this 429 to hitting that uh, a special counter that blocks you and just gives you connection resets. Got it. So, so is... if you're hammering even the, this too much, then you'll get blocked further. Yeah, so this is really cool because we still allow normal activities, but as soon as we detect something that's either going to consume way too many resources or look slightly malicious based on the volume, it uh, shuts it off. And this is only impacting, due to the way you configured this rules, it's only impacting my particular IP. Yep. Or, yeah, so everyone else the in the world... The goal is to give feedback to the good users, but to eventually block the bad ones. Got it. Okay, great. So that was a neat explanation about that. And of course, let's take a look at some stats. Uh, I'm going to move the stats one closer. Now, uh, this is a lot of uh, numbers here. Yep. 
this is a bunch of stats that they provide to you per back end and so this is basically stock uh stock ha proxy yep this is just something that's built in i believe it's i don't think that this that this specific portion of it is usually off by default but the prometheus one is sometimes off by default but i believe that these are usually baked in i think okay so so here we but have... so, most distros don't include the next one that we look at so let's just take a peek so we have some current sessions some bytes so here we have three six seven two eight we reset a bunch Uh, so it was three, six, seven. There we go, and it just refreshed. Two. So we saw there some more bytes in. Okay, so yeah, you up. see the uptime and just some general information. You know, whenever you're kind of troubleshooting why things are or are not working, this is a good place to go. Okay, that's awesome. And then let's look at the metrics. I'm going to pull this one over. The metrics looks like it's next to your blog tab. Yeah, unfortunately, somehow my uh, Zoom. There we go. I'm just waiting for the Zoom window to get out of your way. Get out of my way. Okay, so here's metrics. So yep. explain what some of these are. So this is something that they bake into some version after two point. I don't know, four ish, five ish, something around those releases, but they now give you the Prometheus exposition format. So you can slurp these up with your Prometheus instance and get metrics in Grafana or whatever year. Okay. So this isn't designed to be human readable. This is really designed well, to be ingested by Prometheus so you can display uh, it in Grafana. I personally prefer this. So I like the exposition format because the format itself is text-based. And as you can see, part of the format is including the type of thing it is, like a counter, as well as help text around it. And oh, okay. they were pretty good about that. So I like this because you can curl it and then grep and even script it a little bit when you're trying to do testing and stuff. So oh yeah, that's it, great. it's a nice consumable format for the Unix ecosystem. So. It's nice to enable it for local testing, but make sure not to expose it publicly. Got it. Okay. It does give them internals, let people figure out what rate limits are and stuff like that. All right. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So on the debug page, uh, you've got some ways we can test things automatically with these paths, right? Yep. So if you pop that one open, that will give you a page that you'll see there's the current path rate limit is only one. So you can see transaction path HTTP rate limit of one because you're on the one. So now if you were to ref refresh this, you'll yeah. see something. Keep going. Do you see how it says path HTTP rate limited true? Uh, so now you can see that you're rate limited. But because this is a special path, we put this before the global checks. So the only way you're going to get rate limited now is if you keep spamming until you hit your con rate limits. So if you were to keep spamming this page and you went over the any of the other limits, then you'll eventually end up getting completely blocked and you won't even see this page render because it'll happen at the very start of the entry of the config. Got it. So this URL here, this rate slash one, you've got an access, an ACL on it for just allowing only one HTTP connection. And so, yeah, and where this is, is if you go into the repo real quick. Yeah, let's take a look. And you go up to the files at the top, you can see in config, if you hop into config in a new tab, config, yep. And then if you go into the Nope. So you want to go into the maps. Yep. And then rates by URL. So all I did was inside of here, I defined just some routes and then the rates that should be applied for them. 
Okay, and this is what we were you were talking about with the the map files and by exactly. Eight. So if so, you were to change that URL to eight, your limit would go up to eight, and this is just a good way to do testing, and it's really just an example too. So, got it. So can we show in the config what's reading this map? Yep. So the inside of your config. This one. And I touched on this a little bit in the README, but if you go into here into the haproxy.config, we can get into the. Yep. So you'll see the proc dot. See those? Those are the process level ones from config.map. Now, if you go down a little further and we get into our our main HTTP front end, then you can kind of see the meat of things. So if you go down just a little bit more, you'll eventually see that path that That's rates by there. IP. Yep, exactly that one. What that does is checks all of the global limits. I don't know. We could go through this if you wanted to, but. Well, so I'm trying to find. So here's the one that it was path. The this is what we were just reading or looking at where it grabs the the rate limit by path, right? Yep. This is that technique to turn an ACL to a string because there's no way to from their their log format to say, hey, print the value, a, a truthy value of this ACL. But that's something you kind of want to know inside the debug file. So what I do is I say set a variable with an ACL prefix string. If this ACL is true, else if it's false, I set it to false. So it's just a little pattern to have a printable result of an ACL check. Got it. And so is this actually what's enabling that that access control is this line here where it's- Yep, inside of the debug.html. Yeah. What I'm doing is simply making a string in the transaction variable, ACL string is path HTTP rate limited. If we are currently rate limited and I make it true. Otherwise I make it false if we're not rate limited. And then explain who who sets this variable. How do these counters get implemented or up? So the is path HTTP rate limited if you control F that and yep. it's actually directly above, but you can see that shows up at the create ACL for HTTP rates. Yep. That's where I fetch the var for the current path rate limit, and then I subtract the current rate from what the current limit is. So you subtract the current rate of HTTP requests from what the current HTTP request rate limit is. Got it. And if that value is less than zero, then that ACL reports true. Got it. So this is really the result of comparing the limit to what the current value is and making sure that that is less than zero. And if it's greater exactly. than zero, then it's going to be limited. And that's how that ACL then gets applied yep. based on this sort of weird math. So you got to have your exactly. limit up front, subtracting the current and making sure you're still within, you're still less than zero. You're not you don't have more current connections or more current HTTP requests than what you're yep. limiting by. And that's due to a small, I guess it's a just a little quirk of how they do their ACLs. So on the right hand side there, you're never allowed to have a variable. So you can't just Over simply here. do if var transaction rate limit is yep. less than what the current rate is. So there's no such thing as a less than and then putting the val another var of the rate current on the right hand side it doesn't allow you to to do that so you have to have this sub pattern to to do it instead and you know you get used to it got it okay very interesting but it is equivalent to just doing a less than operation really with vars on both sides yeah so it's equivalent of saying if the current is less than the limit Yep, if you replace the comma with an LT, yep. if that kind of syntax was supported, but unfortunately it isn't. Got it. You have to do this weird math subtraction and then compare to zero. Yep, but it works. And it's a pattern everywhere in, that I've seen in HA proxy. So at least once you see it, you know it. Got it, okay, interesting. So let's, uh, let's jump back to our front page. We'll look at the readme again. 
So we kind of got down here for these special test pages. Uh, so for instance, yep. if we uh, opened up this guy, let me just change our one to 128. Now we'll this, see it goes up. this in order to hit it, I have to, I would have to hit it pretty hard. I would have to do 128 requests per second, right? Per 10 seconds. Yep. Per 10 seconds. So I'll, I'll hold down and see. Uh, I think you could probably get there. Okay. So we got, oh, so you actually, this is interesting because what happened is we have a connection rate limit too. So what you did is you hit the global rate limit, which we have set really conservatively inside of this example. So you weren't even able to exceed this per path limit because you hit the global, you hit the global limit. Got it. Yeah. Cause I did see the, the per path limit was still only about like 16 to 17 before this got triggered. So, right. Yep. That, We're hitting a higher limit that we give more precedence to. Yeah. And that's because we set that to a really generous value in our configuration. But in this example, it's a, it's a smaller value. Right. And so we have another one here. This would be an example of one that we wanted to allow an in-between, not, not just one connection, but four connections per, yep. per for this particular URL. So you could refresh this one every couple of seconds and be just fine. Yeah. And so oh, I say I got to four. Now... Now it got limited because this this five is greater than the four, and we saw this jump to true. Exactly. Yep, because I made five requests per that 10-second interval, and on that fifth request, I got limited. Yep, and there's lots of interesting things you can do with just changing the precedence of the ACLs but, and changing the patterns because maybe you want it so if you put something in the rates by URL that – it isn't overwritten by a global thing. Maybe you want the local limits to take precedence over the global for whatever reason you may have. And just by changing where the ACLs are evaluated or how you do your checks, you can accomplish all of that. And uh, I'm assuming the higher it is in the config, the more priority, or is it? Sort of, it's more like where you act on it. So where you make your decisions to, to do a definitive final operation like return a status or select a backend things like that although there are quirks with using backends and that it runs through all http requests operations even after the use backend declaration so uh, sometimes you need to do a little more work to make sure that like some intermediate ACLs sometimes help got it okay and then uh you've got a v1 prefix this is just the default it's, a, it's essentially identical to the one that we were just on, except it shows that you're able to change the errors to include JSON instead. So in this, in this route, if you were actually in a V1 HA proxy rate yeah. and you exceeded any of the global ones, you get this instead. We get a JSON response back rather than... Yep. This one, which is not a V1, this will just give us a text response. Exactly. So because we... that's a pretty common thing. You have like a UI front end and a, you know, an API that you're calling, and this is a good way to show how to yeah, differentiate. This is actually here. the pattern of our architecture. We have APIs that live on V1, and with this, we can report back so that the client, when it's calling a V1 endpoint it's calling an api it expects to only get json back and so it would be a really big hassle on the client if we threw back some non-json because then we'd have to have separate error conditioning based on uh whether it was json or not so this is really cool the fact that we can return json on a v1 endpoint versus text on a, a normal document endpoint and so that's exactly that's in the config as well all right, very good. Uh, so the show maps, should we go through some of those maps? Uh, I sure, know. so I gave a couple easy examples. So now that you have it, you could go back to your terminal if you wanted to, and you could run that show maps command. And Let's do that. I just wanted to show that there is a socket running and it's a little tricky to 
get things to go from your host into your guest to show those maps. So you can either, you know, exec in, run the commands manually, or if you were to type make and then show, show dash maps. Maps, okay. You can see the maps. So that's going to print you the a raw dump using the socket admin. Got it. So this is better than having to cat through everything. We can just do a, a show maps and it'll it'll list out all of the maps. Yeah. Under the hood, if you scroll up a little bit, it does quite a quite a bit of work to get there. So you have to do some echoes to that temp API soc, mm -hmm. and then you have to make sure to properly have your quotes nested and everything else, just so you can ultimately pipe that into bash running in under docker got it and th this is useful if you're trying to look at a, a live running server and make sure that the the maps that it's running off of is actually what you expect yeah. it exactly and on top of that there's also one more called show dash that it's the show dash tables and that is something that i use have to use quite a bit when i'm troubleshooting too because that'll show you what the actual values are so if something's not making sense yeah I w and i want to make sure it's not like the config itself that's making a value wrong then i can come in here and see what what the does actual sick table have got it so, th and this so if you were said... to make some requests you would see stuff here okay so let's uh let's try that let's uh go back to our browser Um, You'll have to be pretty quick, but if you can get 10 and then get back over, you'll be able to see requests. it. Or if you'd like, you, there's another command for this purpose that might help you too. In here, if you did make watch dash tables, oh, there it goes. Got it. Okay. If so you change show to watch, yeah. it'll actually. Let's do that. It'll actually do it in a little loop. So this is useful because, you know, if you're wanting to see snapshots every second, now you can go in there and you can see it come up and you can see how it evolves and how it slowly expires, which is a good visualization. Okay. Yeah. So I just made a couple of requests. We see it just drop from six to five and, and you can control C that four, anytime you want. Down to three, down to two and boom, we're, we're back to baby fresh. Okay, that's exactly. really cool. Now, is this something that you had to uh, engineer up, or is this part of HA Proxy? So this is something I made. So it's essentially just inside the make file. I have a few commands, and um, they just kind of do a, a for loop that sleeps every second and executes inside oh. the container until you interrupt it. Well, that looks extraordinarily helpful to try to see exactly what's going on real time when you've got somebody complaining that things are getting blocked. Exactly. And also when you're just trying to tweak things locally, little things like this can kind of help save time. So if it helped me, I kind of tried to include it. Oh, that's awesome. All right, let's take a look back at our... That was show maps and show tables. Very cool. Okay, so this is how you actually broke down our config. Uh, or the config in this example. So we've got obviously some more complexity, but for a basic example of how to do a global uh, high level limits, again, we've got a connection limit based on the total currents, a connection rate, and that's the number of connections over a per time instance. And for us, we're doing what, 10 seconds? Is exactly, this... we chose a 10 second sliding window. Yeah, is that, where is that set? Is that the 600? That's inside, uh, so that is the stat socket and that's just the permissions of that socket. I see. So that's, this, and I actually break this down. So if you keep going, you'll see after, maybe I should put the breakdown above it, but after I post the whole thing as one, I kind of break it down piece by piece so okay and so here was getting that data from uh the stats creating that stat socket with the permissions 
And yeah, so that's actually the one that, that does the show maps. So that's a local socket. You, they call it the stats socket, mm -hmm. but it's really just this local admin thing. And then the what, there's a web UI that exposes that stat socket to a degree with the slash stats Got it. endpoint, I believe. So Now, this is a pretty important value, right? Because connections are one of the things that's most easily exhausted if somebody just opens up a, a really quick uh, script or a, a long running curl that just exactly. beats the heck out of it. So it is a finite resource they use file handles. So there's only so many that you have in a system and they all use a chunk of memory. So it's definitely one of the more important things to add an upper bounds to. Yeah. And uh, so the way you would know if you have uh, a setting that's too small is you're going to see a lot of what 429 returns no you're blocks. actually you're going to probably see connection resets or blocking so i think if if it's exhausted it'll probably block until the connection timeout is reached and then you'll probably get a reset okay That's what so, I would so uh, when the connection starts to get denied you you'll see that at the network layer really first you won't see an http response you're going to see exactly raw connection so really ugly errors in the browser window if somebody the browser will simply show you that generic connection yeah got it you okay. know failed connection closed connection reset it's really up to them how they handle a tcp reset right okay great and so here go into a little bit of the limits again we've got the global ones and then the per path ones and so for exactly. a lot of folks, maybe they could get away with just using global limits if they don't have uh, any specific routes or paths that consume any more resources than the other, or if they're not very concerned about limiting things like uh, we are with password resets, user creates, or you know user logins. Yeah. So Yeah, these are just our general defaults. So we have like the static rate limit that we wanted to make a lot higher. And then, you know, our AP, a API rate limit is a little more restricted in general. Got it. Okay. And then yeah. here we're going into the config map. Again, you're just yep. putting some values in, in map files so that you don't have to adjust the, the .cfg file. You can just tweak these in a map far easier than... Uh, editing the raw config and again you say that's beneficial without because you don't have to do reloads right yeah for the for the proc ones you would still have to reload because we use proc so it's kind of a nice separations of concerns thing too it's a little cleaner syntax one shop stop to see what these values are so you could just as easily put them in line in the config but you know that said you can also put these set vars you can move those to HTTP request set vars and they could be transaction variables instead of proc variables. And then that config map would be loaded every request. Got so it. it's kind of flexible to whatever your needs are or when, when you need the data to be live and how often it mutates. Okay, and then we've got some predefined yeah. defaults and this is where you uh, hard coded the response text in that 429 response. That lives in this file here and this is how you can set the path to that file for when you want to deliver a 429. Exactly. And then of course you've got some timeout values. Now what type of timeouts are these? So those are the client and server timeouts and how long we'll wait for a connection to be established. The TCP handshake I believe. Okay so for instance if we're trying to uh if someone's trying to make a connection and that client goes over 50 seconds the server will 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 time out then so for the timeout connect specifically that one's going to set the maximum amount we'll wait for a connection to succeed got it so how long we'll wait before and that's just the, the tcp connection so how long until we consider the connection to be established now, is this helpful for things like sin floods or not really? Yeah, and one interesting note about the default section is yeah. that these, if you go down under there a little bit, um, 
the and I, I thought I went over it a little bit, but the what oops, no, uh it was I thought it was directly beneath. But essentially the the defaults it's contextual. So basically other sections like front ends, back ends, etc. There's some areas in which they'll say if this optional parameter is not set, we'll look it up from the defaults. So that timeout connect may be about a TCP connection in one place, and it may be about an HTTP connection outbound or inbound, et cetera, in other places. Got it. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So in the config, we've got this front end, front end metrics. So this is what uh, you're using to, to spit out this particular page here that can be ingested by a fancy curl in a grep or something as complex as Prometheus. Exactly. And to, to build that, you basically just uh, enabled these few config items to, to have HA proxy bind to a specific port, uh, yep. serve this exporter. And then what, what are these stats enable things? I'm, those That's just saying what those are some stats options. So that says enable the stats and set the stats you read to slash stats and refresh them every 10 seconds. Got it. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And we bind on an environment variable. And if that environment variable is not present, we just glob to 89 on 01. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then HTTP errors. This is where you point to the the JSON version versus the HTML version. And exactly. that's really cool. Uh, now, backend tar pit. This is where uh, the backend being the V1. How did you specify that the V1 should get the JSON versus the normal one getting the HTML? Yeah, so the purpose of this was to say, Okay, so there's this concept of HTTP dash errors, which creates a error group. How do we use that? So in a backend, if you use an error file statement, you can specify the type of group of error files that will be used by default when HTTP proxy runs into an error. Got it. Okay, that makes now, sense. Now, as far as how you were to select the backend tar pit, mm -hmm use ACLs at your own discretion. Uh, we could go over it in the config how I do that, but uh, for the purpose of the HTTP errors, it was just to show how to use that error group. Got it. And the, and the fact that you can create two different error groups. Exactly. As many as you wanted to, and then refer to those. So if you had multiple brands or different, you know, types of APIs that, you know, are, should have different types of JSON, you could sure. add those to. That's really cool. Uh, all right, the back end B debug. So this is for creating That's our... the one line that we use to serve the debug file. Got it. Which is pretty straightforward. But inside of it, I just kind of touched on what exactly this format is. So if you go up just a tad, I explained that it's just a log formatted string. And it's a neat little feature tucked away under HTTP request return, which is fairly powerful when you apply it to, you know, some HTML like this. You can see all types of requests. So this is stuff. basically like a, a one line web server. We can exactly that shows return really important transaction variables and such. The status, the content type being HTML, uh, and then the file location being this HTML file. So boom. A very yep. And during very development, succinct. a lot of the time, I would just inject this randomly in places when I was trying to debug. So I just say use back in this and comment out use back in the right back end and then do the same process that caused me to hit get rate limited or hit some other ACL. And it was a quick, easy way to see what was happening and see all of the context. Now there's some dynamic replacements in here. Is this what you're referring to as the the log formatted? Where Yep. Or Those this... are log formatted strings. And so HA proxy knows how to interpret this and then inject these things like environment variables, the variable, the HA proxy variables itself. Yep. And the and it's a special format. This is essentially just a templating language. 
yeah. in a sense, not nearly as powerful. It's just, it's really a log formatted string, but since it's multi-line, it can do a whole lot. Cool. And this is just built in as part of HA proxy's ability to, exactly. to parse that. That's pretty neat. Mostly meant for logging, but works for debug files too. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. All right. And then uh, what is this, the table name? So a, a stick yeah, table, so... can you explain a little bit more about what a stick table is? Yep, so that's where we store all of this information about requests. So there's a concept of stick tables and think of them as just uh, some data structures in memory that are like indexed and have counters. And you know they're pretty complex data structures, I'm pretty sure since they expire and everything else. But as you go on through your HA proxy config, you call these special functions that track requests into these counters and you can apply those counters to specific tables Got it. and then you can read those counters back later so it's really these stick tables that you're instructing ha proxy in the config to write and increment these counters based on your criteria and then in the ACLs, you read out these values from the stick table to compare to your limits and then that, exactly. based on that ACL is when you can deny access uh, to those resources. Okay, got it. And then I see yep. here we've got two stick tables, one where we're doing it just by source IP, and then the next where you've got the source IP plus what they're trying to request. So yep. that, that way we can uh, put a little bit more fine grain limits because sometimes if you make a request to an HTML page, for instance, you might have like 50 or 60 other requests for images and CSS and JS, but we really want to limit access to the actual document because it's not so bad to let a lot of those static assets come through. So we can have a much higher rate limit by the raw IP, but then on the very specific uh, path that actually causes a page render or causes some sort of uh, in-depth web server resource, we can really lock that down to a much lower limit and get yep. much better protections. And to add to that, having two separate ones, one that doesn't have the host and path taken into consideration, it helps protect us against someone hitting, since we have a multi-tenant environment with lots of different hosts yeah. that you know we set up the SSL for and the C names and everything else, they can't spread out to the upper bounds of their limits across all of our different hosts that we have sure. and do attacks that way. So it tries to, you know, blanket over a subset of multiple tenants as well. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting. All right. And then uh, a tar pit by content type. Is this just where we decide which error group goes for which Yep, so once someone hits the rate limit, they start getting the tar pit. And they'll continue to get the tar pit until they hit connection global limits. So once we've seen them connect too much, meaning that they're they're making too many requests to the tar pit, or they're just opening too many different URLs or browsers or et cetera, then they no longer get nice pretty errors and we use this little hack with ACLs and lazy evaluation and such to block them and give them TCP connection resets. But we always try to make a be best effort for legitimate users who are starting to become rate limited to give them some feedback, kind of give them a pause and show them what's happening before the more extreme limits kick in. So it's kind of a tiered approach. Got it. So there's really two ways we respond. The first way is on the rate limiting if you just go over some of the connection limits, that's usually uh, you'll get back this status 429. But you're saying if they severely stay rate limited, then we start blocking them at the connection level. And that's when they get moved into the tar pit. Is that right? Well, no. So the tar pit is what shows the nice error messages. And that's, that's basically where rate limited users go who are backing off. Now, if you're not backing off and you're continuing to make requests, you're going to keep incrementing your global limits. So if you start exhausting even our tar pits with connections or requests, then you're going to hit a whole different area of ACLs 
and you're going to be blocked in a different way. So we could look at that real quick if you wanted, but it's just a way to kind of add a different kind of tier of naughty users, I guess. A different tier of protection that if somebody's more extreme and continues to go over the rate limits, we can start yeah. blocking them at the network level to save more server resources. Exactly. We don't want to, the tar pit, you want to use sparringly just to display good messages to good users. Yeah. Because it does keep that connection open. It uses a resource, but it's kind of a necessity to, you know, have a, at least trust that they're making the request in good faith at first. And then if they keep going, that's when they'll get the connection resets. Okay, great. And then this example is, this is how you do the one line web servers to, to give our sample application. Exactly. Super simple. So in order to make a, a, a web application, all we got to do is this one line. And, then yep. and those are LF strings. So what I'll do while I'm like, you know, doing some testing sometimes is pop in a return status LF string and inline some of the variables that we have in like our debug. Mm -hmm. So that can be useful sometimes if you want to know what's going on in a back end or why it's, you know, not selecting some sticky server or something like that. You can talk, you can toss in one of these and just kind of get a quick log string printed out. Got it. Well, this has been excellent. Looks like uh, we went through most of it. Yeah, we've reached the end. We've reached the end of all this <laughs> fantastic. We've been rate limited ourselves. <laughs> we have. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, well, any other final comments? Uh, how how did you enjoy this? Was it fun? Yeah, you know, it's like any other software. It's got some quirks, but I think HA Proxy is really reliable, and you know, it's really powerful. And you know, if you don't try to force something into it that it wasn't really designed for, it works really well. Well, great. So, All right, shout out to the HA Proxy developers. We like what you're doing. Job. <laughs> well done. Hats to you, sir and ma'ams and exactly. Ma all right, great. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. Hopefully this is really interesting. And, you know, give us any feedback. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.